Hello, everybody. How's it going? Chrissy here, and I'm here with uh, PZ Myers, who many of you will know. Um, he is on, oh, how do you pronounce it? Furring? Furring? Everyone always asks me that. Isn't it obvious? Come on. Pharyngula. Pharyngula. Very good. Okay. <laughs> he, that is his blog, and I will be um, putting some links from his blog. PZ? Oh, it's not me. Hang on. Remember that part when I said how great I was at this? Um, all of a sudden... Hang on. Oh, I just I just muted Brian. Sorry, and the static went away. Oh, all right. <laughs> so that's that's where it is. I think I think you can mute, unmute yourself whenever you need to talk, though. I hope. Okay, hang on. Yes, we have uh, Brian here. Who? Um, you know what? Do you have headphones, Brian? He's wearing them. I do. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. So I guess you're going to be have to pretty much mute yourself when you're not speaking because okay. there's a little bit of feedback for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh -huh. All right. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Long time listener. First time caller. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. So we are here um, talking about... Uh, the recent dust up where boy is this a long story too to get through oh my goodness um hopefully most people will know something about it so i'm not having to like go into the whole thing but there is a um a philosophy professor from portland state university named peter bogosian um and he recently, with his friends James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, um, got together and they put out a whole bunch of um, hoax articles to various and sundry academic journals having generally to do with what they call grievance studies. So this would be um, anything it really seemed to go across a, a large group, right? Um, there was, uh, eventually he was able to get four of these fake papers that he wrote accepted into, I wanna say Fat Studies Journal, um, the Journal of Poetry Therapy, um, there was, um, what is it called? Hypatia, which is a feminist glaciology, I think. I want to say, and I don't remember the fourth one. Feminist, uh, geography, feminist geography, I believe. Ah, feminist geography. All right. I knew it was some feminist something. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was sort of like uh, it, it anything that had to do with sort of progressive... I guess ideas or that they translated as as putting forward these progressive ideas um, was where they sent it out. Now when they published their results, um, they referred to it as an ethnography, as a study, um, and other language uh, appropriating those sorts of ideas, even though it's it's questionable, I think we could all agree that it's uh, it's worth based on its um scientific qualifications is really questionable, but that's how they presented it, or at least to a point. Um, so the problem with that is that there are fe um, regulations, uh, and Peter works for a state funded university. Um, which obviously means he falls under the ethical regulations about human studies. Um, some of the most immediate of which is 
if there is any kind of human interaction as a part of your study, any kind, like it could just be a survey that you could be checking off boxes and sending that out to people. That is a, a, um, a human study and you need to have uh, to go through the ethics board and they need to sort of review that and make sure it's, it's fulfilling um, basic ethical principles. And he did not do that. And um, therefore he came under their auspices. They brought him in. They um, demonstrated that he did not do that. And I think, I believe he's still waiting now to find out um, there's a couple of other ethical issues that they're discussing and what, if any, consequences he'll have to face. In the meantime, he has um, gone to the known ethics experts of Twitter um, in order to uh, seek their wisdom and input that they could then bring to the uh, panel. And they've been sending things in there, um, which has been some some of their uh, ideas about what passes for ethics has been fascinating. But other than that, um, that's sort of where we're at. And uh, in the past, I haven't talked much about this particular issue, being that I am not an academic person. I don't you know, involve myself in studies or research. But I do I, I do have a background um, that allows me to speak a little bit to ethics and why these kinds of ethical rules are important, why they were put into place in the first place. And I can speak to that. So I thought, you know, bring in people like PZ Myers, um, who will be talking soon. And uh, and maybe we can have a reasonable discussion about about this and, and talk about some of the issues that this raises. So I'm going to bring it to PZ um, and then to also waiting in the wings very patiently and muted, uh, Brian, so that they can both sort of introduce themselves and, and talk a little about who they are. All right, and so PZ. Okay, yeah, so I'm PZ Myers. I'm a biologist. I work at the University of Minnesota, Morris. Uh, currently, I am working on spiders, as you can see. They're very large spiders. Um, and I got to say that, you know, as somebody who has mainly worked on embryos and early development and things like that, I've never had to worry about IRBs before because I don't do human studies. But even so, you know, I'm in this culture. I know if you're going to do any experiments on humans, you have got to submit it for review before you do anything. So, for example, right now I'm preparing for a big spider survey this summer where I'm going to check out various residences around my town and just sort of survey and count the number of spiders and things like that. And it turns out I have to, I may have my career, have to fill out an IRB form because we're going to be going to these houses and we're going to be asking the people living there um, are you afraid of spiders? Do you crush all the spiders that you run into? Do you spray pesticides around your house? You know, things like that that would affect the spider population. And so, you know, even, even me, I have to do this and I know this and I, I'm not afraid of it. It's kind of a routine thing that we should do. So that was one of the shocking things about this is they didn't even bother. Now, you know, Peter Bogosian is a philosopher, and philosophers probably have to do that even less than us biologists. Uh, but he's also got he's all, his degree is in education, and you would think somebody with an EDD would be familiar with it. Try a classroom of kids, college students, and do whatever you want. That if you're if you're doing experiments or observations, that has to be approved of, ahead of time. 
So it's it's a little surprising to me that he screwed up on this one. All right. And Brian, would you like to say hello? Uh, can you? Oh, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. So let's see. You just go up. Oh, you did it. I can't nice. hear you. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you check your settings? Okay, I just... Oh. Okay, I'm tinkering. No, it only tells me I can mute him. Yeah. It's, all, all, it's all my fault. Let's see, I'm trying, trying. As the person who owns this chat, can you do it, Chrissy? Um, all I can really do. Did you just mute yourself? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at this. I was going to say, this is going to be great. It's going to be a one-man show. All right, oh. so he's dropped out. He'll probably come back in, yeah. and, and hopefully we'll be able to um, say hello to us. Yes. All right, so... Let's see. Um, I think that this uh, that there was maybe a question about um, whether or not this hoax or study or ethnography. I call it Schrodinger's study. Really, <laughs> it depends on um, whether it benefits them or not to call it a study. That's when it's a study. Otherwise, it is not. So, but assuming that this sort of generally is something study-like, um, it, it definitely featured human participation because they sent these um, studies that they were doing out to people who had to spend, uh, believing that they were actual studies by actual people. Um, then you go in and you send it to these people, they spend hours looking at them, reviewing, um, and therefore that was human participation. Um, mm. So there, there are a few things that I hear coming up as, as arguments. Um, first of all, I, I want to deal with the argument that, well, um, you can't tell them you know, uh, because it is, that would give them a heads up and they would know. Um, that is a, an ends justifies the means kind of argument. Uh, and uh, the point of having ethical regulations and a board that sort of can um, look at ethics and uh, talk to you about it and make sure things are going well. But at the end of the day, if you cannot ethically perform a, um, a study that you're doing, if it is ethic, if your um, violations of human rights are, are just so necessary that you cannot do the study without violating people's consent and rights and, and basic things like that, and there's no way to sort of mitigate or work around that, then you can't do the study. Like that's not, that's, <laughs> no. it's not an argument of, you know, I'm sorry, the only way we could get this information that we want is to hurt people, so. Well, but the, you know, even that excuse is bogus because uh, this is something that IRBs routinely have to deal with is deception studies in psychology, for instance. There, there's lots of experiments where you have to mislead the subjects about exactly what you're testing so you don't, you know, you don't get them to just perform the way you expect them to. So deception is really common. Um, so to think of some examples, you've all heard of the Milgram study, right? The where uh, they've got they've got the subjects are supposed to control a dial that adjusts how much shock somebody receives, right? 
And the people getting shocked were all actors. So that was approved. It's a, it's a, it still got ethical problems because they should have stopped when the subject started freaking out or abusing this, this power. But uh, still, it, it was initially approved. Uh, there are also all kinds of studies that involve leading questions, for instance. So um, in, in tests of the reliability of, of eyewitnesses, for example, they might have subjects view a video of a red car hitting a yellow car. And afterwards, they asked, they asked if, the, if the yellow car ran a stoplight. Did you see it run the stoplight when there was no stoplight? So that's deception again. And again, that, that's not a problem for these kinds of studies, that this particular study would, the part where they are submitting these, these, uh, these fake studies would not, would raise a few eyebrows, but it wouldn't be the death knell for the study. Testing. Oh, is Brian back? Hey, yes. Brian. All right. I'm on, I'm on Wi-Fi, I'm afraid. So I, I had the brilliant idea to turn off the camera part. Um, so, oh, uh, I, I did want to interject too that uh, I don't know if the two of you have read it, but there was a uh, there was a New York Magazine article that went up. Mm -hmm. uh, the title being "Is a Professor Getting Railroaded for Questioning Social Justice Dogma?" Kind of a clickbaity title, but it actually goes pretty well into um, IRBs and and the sort of stuff that you have to deal with. Um, I missed that part of PZ talking because I was resetting everything, but. Uh, for people outside of academia, I thought I, I found it was really uh, just detailed enough to show how thorny this can be, but that there's there's ways to deal with these questions. The way it seems to me is that Pete just it never occurred to him that he was actually experimenting on the people so much as he was, you know, the three of them were assaulting an entire you know wing of academia that he feels is illegitimate. Yeah, yeah, I I. I talked about that article on my blog, and it's by Jesse Single, unfortunately. So <laughs> he's he's not exactly the best to have review this stuff. But he did, uh, you know, he did dig into it fairly, and he got, for instance, there were he re interviewed four experts on IRBs and the ethics of experimentation, and they all unanimously agreed that this was a violation of good ethics. So that was a that was a takeaway point from his article for me. Mm. Well, and uh, just to back up for a little bit for um, the handful of people that are watching this uh, stream, I was a uh, the reason I'm relevant and have been invited along is I was a uh, TA for Peter Bogosian for um, almost two full years. So I have a pretty good idea what he's like in class and a somewhat lesser view of uh, what he's like in private. So I have some insights. I guess, as to the sort of academic he is or is not, as the case may be. Oh, do tell. <laughs> well, <laughs> Let's hear the stories. <laughs> well, how, how long you got? <laughs> um, I mean, I've uh, he and I have had a falling out since I stopped being associated with him at the university. Um, I was at Portland State from uh, 2012 through 2016. Um, I am I'm no longer in the ivory tower. I'm now, as Homer Simpson says, a guy at a place. Uh, but I was very interested in philosophy and he was one of the first instructors in the department that I got to know, which was kind of ironic because he doesn't, he doesn't really do philosophy as it turns out. Um, there's, there's been a lot of hand wringing about whether or not he'll be able to um, be replaced if the, if he doesn't teach at Portland State anymore, if if those subjects like critical thinking and stuff will be, still be covered, the only classes that were just Peter Bogosian classes were atheism and new atheism. Everything else is kind of boilerplate in the department. Um, the critical thinking, business ethics, uh, computer ethics. Uh, there are other instructors that have taught those courses also before and since. Um, but he's uh, overall. He's just a, um, he's probably the laziest academic I've ever worked with, honestly. Um, yeah, he- uh, I'm, I'm a pretty lazy academic, so it's shocking <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> um, he's, he has, he's had a lot of TAs and we all got to talking and got to, to know each other pretty well and kind of swapped stories. But he, um, 
he has a set of lectures that he knows he wants to give at the beginning of a term. And uh, terms at Portland State are only 10 weeks long. So you kind of got to get in, get what you can get, and you're done. Um, the, uh, the TA makes puts together the syllabus generally, uh, does all the, the grading, writes the tests, gives the tests. He doesn't even come to class on test day. Um, does all the, uh, the attendance, all the bookkeeping. Pretty much what Pete does is he comes in and he talks about what he felt like talking about and then he goes. Um, and that's been pretty uniform across uh, everyone else I know that's worked for him. Um, conversely, I've, I've talked to people who've had other TA positions in the philosophy department at Portland State and a lot more, um, a lot more uh, heavy lifting was done by the actual professor. Um, it was more of an opportunity for the, uh, the TA to learn the kinds of things that they might need to do if they want to go to grad school and are going to need a teaching fellowship. Um, we didn't, I didn't really get a lot of that from Pete. He doesn't even have his computer set up in his office. Uh, from the minute he moved into his office in the philosophy department, his computer is in a pile on the floor next to the desk. He just uses his iPhone. Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe he does the bulk of his writing at home. But from what I understand, too, he's offered to help uh, collaborate with students on writing papers and then they pretty much write the paper and he'll he'll also be on there as a as a co-author um i haven't experienced that though i didn't get sucked into that but i did help him with his app the athios app that was kind of a big deal shortly after his book was kind of a big deal um and i saw a lot of that too yeah you know you got me thinking i ought to apply to psu <laughs> yeah. well it's a shame too because it kind of cuts both ways. Some people who are fans of him and more this IDW sort of thing generally, like they're on board with Dave Rubin and Christina Hoff Summers and yeah. that whole side of things, um, think of him as a real feather in the cap of, of Portland State Philosophy Department. And I'm, I, I find it uh, very unfortunate that he's bringing shame, as far as it looks to me, to, uh, to the department because there's some really fine minds at work there doing really hard work and really pushing students and... Uh, and he doesn't represent that in the slightest, let alone whatever academic value was supposed to be in having people like Carl Benjamin come talk or, uh, oh. uh, you know, uh, what was his name? James, James Damore, that whole thing. I'm not sure yeah. what the academic value that was supposed to be, but uh, he's just characteristically, he's he's been courting controversy more and more. His book didn't pick up as much dust as he wanted. And so he's kind of been going this Dave Rubin, Jordan B. Peterson direction of uh, let's let's make a, mole, a mountain out of the molehill that is SJWs on campus. And I mean, it's been lucrative for him. He's got a lot of Twitter followers now. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've also heard from uh, somebody who teaches at PSU who asked me to keep him, keep his name out of things. He wants to be anonymous on this. Uh, and he didn't know, he doesn't know much about Bogosian, but he did say, and I, you know, I got to say this to sort of counter what you're saying, is that he thought PSU was commendable in how they handled adjuncts and faculty and thought they did a really good job of sharing the load. And, you know, it, it wasn't one of these terrible places that grinds the life out of their adjuncts. Um, and I think that's worth saying. So, um, Overall, my experience at Portland State had, was a very positive one. Yeah, there didn't seem to be a lot of the grinding down you hear of of like relying too much on part-time adjuncts. Um, they recently expanded to uh, adjuncts now will get a two-year contract instead of just one year, so they don't have to worry over the summer whether or not they're going to be working. Things uh -huh. like that. Like they they seem to be pretty fairly um, dealt with generally, in my experience. Yeah, that's that's actually good to hear. It's one of the things I. I often am concerned about with universities that have lots of adjuncts is are they treating them like dirt or are they actually, you know, treating them as, as valuable members of the community? And it sounds like PSU does that. So that's, that's a plus. I, I think that sounds good. So again, I should be applying there because apparently if you're a full-time faculty, you can <laughs> slack. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I do think, and uh, I guess I should branch out from there. I, I have found a lot of the things that the, uh, this 
threesome has particularly done to be ethically questionable at best, right? So um, the fact that James Lindsay secured funding for this whole project and got paid, but won't say who's funding them. Oh, interesting. So like that's ethically dubious. Um, the idea that instead of going the academic route, you would um, get a documentarian and he's following you around, like the whole scene where um, Peter Bogosian, I don't know if you saw the YouTube video that they put out, um, and he's in his robe, you know, getting his iPhone and, and showing it to the guy, look, they called me, and um, and you're sitting there going, is his documentarian sleeping over now? Like, what? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> just, Casual. Just yeah. in case, you know, something happens, I better <laughs> just be here all the time. You know? Well, he's... He portrays himself as Mr. Casual. He is one of the professors who's at the beginning of, of every semester will say, please call me Pete. Don't call me Dr. Bogosian. I don't want you to feel like my title means I'm above you or my words are more important. He purposely will wear, you know, sloppy t-shirts and just try and be Mr. Easygoing guy. He's just another dude. It's all part of his branding. It's, it's very calculated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you would think if, you know, you know think if, if he had to, call in this documentarian and arrange to have himself filmed, he could at least take a few minutes to get dressed. <laughs> so, you know, that's, maybe that's maybe so, he took a moment to get undressed. <laughs> yeah, that's so obviously staged and that's just, yeah. Okay. So, so like a lot of these things and, and ethics in, in these things is so very important. So when I kind of snarkily talked about how he, you know, called out to the ethics professors at Twitter. Like, I wasn't entirely joking. Like, I don't think that that is appropriate. Yeah. Um, that's not how we handle these kinds of very serious and complicated issues, you know, because they are serious and they are complicated. So I'm going to tell um, a little bit of a, a story um, people may or may not know. I don't know. I, I know because I, I knew one of the people who had been a participant in this um, situation. This was quite some time ago. The Fernald School in Massachusetts, um, which was a school that had uh, young kids who had disabilities, you know, Down syndrome or, or other um cognitive issues like that, um, learning disabilities, things of that nature. Um, MIT and Quaker Oats worked together. And what they did is they took a group of these little boys and they called it the science club. So they'd take them over to a lab or whatever, and they'd have them playing with like science toys and, and doing things and they would feed them Quaker oats, and in the Quaker oats were radioactive isotopes. And they were doing, um, uh, they were doing these experiments, right? They did not obviously tell the children <laughs> and they did not tell the children's parents, you know, what was going on or what the experiment really was. So, um, and the reason I'm bringing up this, this I think a story that anybody would rationally immediately say, well, that's beyond the pale, um, is because they didn't think it was beyond the pale. Even when they sort of got caught and they got sued and they had to give money, it wasn't like you know the people at MIT said, we are so horrified. We are so shocked. We're, we're, this happened a long time ago, and it was terrible. And we, you know, we want to make this right. And this was horrible, and everything. It was more like, eh, what's consent? You know, people back then they didn't consent. And also, there wasn't enough radioactive stuff in there to really do anything. Probably they were fine. Like, Probably, yes. What's a little tritium? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
you know um <laughs> so uh, the reason that there are strict rules and they're clear and they're across the board and you don't get to fucking decide like oh I, you know what it doesn't matter like <laughs> like uh, i could just i could just you know dispense with this this isn't important for me i'm a good guy is because everybody thinks that they're a good guy and everybody thinks i i don't know people do bad things but nobody starts out doing bad things saying you know what i'm gonna do something evil involving children no like that's not <laughs> you know that's not that's yeah. not a thing like so that's this in stories like this well you right. you mentioned how they're they got funding from some mysterious place mm -hmm. um that's that's another warning sign because if they've gotten funding from a university you know like an internal grant or something they would have told them before you get the money you're going to have to fill out this irb protocol yeah also mm -hmm. if you've got human subjects in your study you're not going to be able to publish it unless you've got an IRB number attached to it. They ask for those kinds of things in real journals. So what work they did is, is basically unpublishable in any real journal for that reason alone. Well, and it sounded too like they cast a pretty wide net and tried to get it in as many journals as they could and th they got it in, a, in any at all was an achievement. You know, I mean, there's been some some attempts to spin it as they got placed in these these high importance journals in these ridiculous fields that shouldn't exist and so forth. And it's just it's, it's not entirely accurate. Yeah. Well, but also, part of the whole spin of the whole story is all about making making the three of them seem as sympathetic as possible. You know, there's a lot of been uh, a lot of dust been kicked up about what if what if. Dr. Bogosian loses his livelihood. This is his livelihood, his job. He's never taken his position or his responsibilities seriously that I've ever seen at the university. He's, uh, he, he is married and has a couple kids. His wife is a, a, a very successful research uh, doctor up at uh, OHSU, our, um, our teaching hospital here. She does very well. Um, she's well known in uh, addiction medicine, I believe. And so he's he's never, in the whole time I've known him, ever been worried about getting fired from Portland State. They told him years ago, and he'll he'll happily tell this story in class all the time, that he was told years ago he'll never get tenure. And he felt like, well, that's great. That just leaves me off the hook to not worry about it then, and I can just do whatever. So yeah. but it but it's part of this spinning them is like, oh, these poor, these poor vocal soldiers for what's right in academia they're putting their lives at risk and it's it's all bullshit yeah and you know if if his wife is a researcher she's got to know about irb does oh, do yeah, they never no, no. talk <laughs> i i cannot speculate too much on what their relationship is like but i know they have certainly uh come to some really specific compromises as far as yeah well well and you know i can sympathize because for instance, my wife does not want to be in the spotlight, so <laughs> she would be really upset if I started, you know, dragging her out as my credentials for understanding psychology. Right. So, yeah. 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 So he's doing the right thing there by keeping, you know, keeping <laughs> quiet. Well, I, I mean, I this is to me, and God knows they would hate, they would hate me for saying this, but I, I do think that this is the white guy privilege thing like it doesn't it's never occurred to me at any of the jobs that i've worked at that i could violate their their rules their regulations right. and their ethics and expect to keep my job well i wouldn't be <laughs> surprised if it simply never occurred to them because it's all it, if it's, it's bringing it back to your ethics issue it's situational ethics like they they're they were seeking to discredit entire branches of academia it didn't occur to them that what they were actually doing was experimenting on these poor fools that had to read this crap and and try and get it submitted because it's their literal jobs you know yeah. it's yeah. just they well, didn't see it that way that that's another issue though is is apparently they don't understand science at all because what they did did not discredit any disciplines at all because the, these these are endemic problems in all of scientific publishing that there are journals 
you know, there's pay to publish journals that aren't very good. There's a lot of, uh, you know, really marginal journals that will, that will publish just about anything. So to go in and say, okay, well, I'm this discipline, I'm gonna bombard these, these journals of various quality with submissions and see if they accept anything doesn't tell you anything because mm -hmm. you can do the same thing in the most important and rigorous disciplines of all like molecular biology and development that's my bias speaking <laughs> and you'll get exactly the same result there there was a study done oh five years ago by john bohanan which also had some ethical concerns by the way uh, but it was a study in which he wrote a computer program to generate cancer research papers, just automatically spin out all these variants on, on, on and make up data and all this kind of stuff. And he did much better than uh, than Bogosian did because he sent out over 300 of these papers and got about 150 of them accepted. Mm. So you know any dis you can do this in any discipline i could point you to all kinds of crappy horrible papers that got published in my field of research and it doesn't mean that i think developmental biology sucks it means yeah this is a problem in general with scientific publishing well and i feel like too that at least for pete i don't i don't know the other two i've read a couple of things that he's written with uh lindsay but uh, i feel like the most possible controversy kicked up was was the point that I mean he from the beginning considered the uh, the conceptual penis hoax paper hoax paper to be a success because it kicked up controversy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it did what it supposedly was going to do or if they yeah. moved the goalposts after the fact to say, oh no, we were actually trying to do this. You know, right? It it, it was a success because it it stirred up some mud. And it got him some Twitter followers, and uh, it sold a couple more copies of his book. Yeah, and if you know, if, if he'd been serious about, well, I'm going to test the quality of reviewers in this field, he could have just stopped at acceptance. You know, once those papers were accepted, exactly. he'd made his point. But yep. he had to go ahead and let them publish them and embarrass themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And it's another ethical problem because now you're now you're injecting garbage into the scientific literature, right? And, and it was totally unnecessary, except for the fact that it gives them a, another angle to spin out controversy. And I think we've seen with the, I mean, an extreme example is the, uh, the, the vaccine autism paper that was retracted, but it's just set off this entire ripple system of BS out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the common conception of how science works. This, this stuff yeah. has, has effect. Well, and for that matter, just the, the design of the whole procedure, I won't dignify by calling it an experiment, was antithetical to good science because what they did is they designed a protocol to give them the result they wanted. Mm -hmm. They wanted to discredit these fields. So they exactly. specifically, there was no controls, there was no attempt to compare this to other fields that, that you know, I would have, I would have thought it would be really good if he'd done this and he'd also submitted a bunch of papers to philo philosophy journals. Uh, of course, then he might have antagonized his colleagues even more, but it would have been a little better. Well, it's <laughs> there was a lot of problems, and I think that you hit on something very important. They like the original. So there was the conceptual penis. That was that thing. Then they set out their first group of hoax papers, and all of them were unsuccessful. Now. Like if, if this is a study, then okay, now you have data. Like, all right, this was not six, no, no. They went back to the drawing board and said, we're gonna keep doing this until we get success. <laughs> and if you have like three PhDs <laughs> who have nothing else to do but sit around and, and try to deceive people, well, yeah. I mean, eventually they're going to figure it out. Like it's not. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I, it's it's really a garbage protocol, that they is... and just that alone should yeah. should discredit them. I'd be ashamed to design an experiment that was that bad, but that's what they did. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and it 
it's enough. It not only has it um, in many people's minds, and in a lot of the people who were already going to dismiss gender studies, right? They were already going to throw that out the window because <laughs> girl cooties, come on. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like... <laughs> oh, and don't forget they're throwing out sociology too. Well, that's the... Yeah. That's the thing. And now the APA came out and it's been working for years and years on, on, um, it already had like a set of criteria of how, of like best practices for women and girls. And now it's got a best practices for men and boys because, you know, they're talking about the high levels of addiction, the high levels of suicide. And this came out. And now I've like literally read under this because people are very upset that they said that not every um, social idea we have about masculinity is helpful or healthy to people. So uh, this has caused like, oh, the, you know, they already proved, Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay, oh. they already proved what garbage this is. Like, no, they, they had nothing to do with psychology. Like yeah. this, and it had nothing to do with critical race theory, but people are talking about white privilege has is, is been debunked. No, it hasn't been touched. It has there's nothing there's nothing that even brushed up against that. You've just decided that now everything you disagree with is grievance studies, and all of grievance studies has been destroyed forever. Right. Postmodernism destroyed. <laughs> Like, yeah. they, don't know what, they don't know what postmodernism is either, but okay. But that's okay because it's just <laughs> and, and the good guys won with their trilbies and their. Right, yes. And they, they never seem to realize that uh, their own study here is a grievance study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it reminds me, there was an article recently about uh, Quillette and how all. Half the time, what they're doing is is complaining about mm -hmm. grievance studies and uh, people taking offense, and the other half is them grieving and taking offense. Yeah, yeah, that was in Slate just recently, and a lot of people were upset about that. <laughs> the right people were upset about it, though, so it's okay. <laughs> and, and it was a fairly because I did read that piece. It was fairly. Uh, like I would have gone much farther than this guy did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like it was pretty fair. I've I've read some fair kinds of middling. He thought, well, you know, like there's some good stuff in there. I'd be like, no. <laughs> there's zero yeah. good things. <laughs> also, the, the author seemed more offended by the fact that Jerry Coyne compared them to slate. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Unforgivable. <laughs> yeah. I, you just diss Slate, but their article on publishing is in Slate. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, but, but, but it, it also yeah. didn't get into the racism and the horrible genetic determinism that Quillette is so fond of endorsing. Mm. Yeah, so it was just, um, there is a level of that they're ridiculous because they are printing story after story about how I was a genius author, but they wouldn't publish my obviously genius books because I'm a white boy. <laughs> they don't, they, white men are against the law now. That's what it was. It was a great story. It's funny, actually, this reminds me too, wasn't this like a year or two ago that uh, uh, Pete and I believe Lindsay, they tried to publish something and they said like over X number of uh, outlets refused to publish this article, so we finally published oh, yes. it here. I don't even remember what it was about, but it was like the first you ever heard of it was like, oh, everyone refused to touch it. Like, really? Uh, is yeah. I don't know if that was just a small ripple. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, but it's just- I do, I do, and I, I'm trying now to remember, because, uh, God, like uh, James Lindsay, for people who are on Twitter, and, and I feel like there's some inside baseball we're getting into now, but oh my goodness. He has this, this thing where he loves to tell you how many words an article has. And it seems like he's judging articles based on, on how many words. So like, um, he will very proudly tell you that their article discussing their hoax was 10,000 words. And he recently did an article about um, 
how he believes feminism is a religion or something to that effect. I'm not going to read it. Like, because <laughs> <laughs> the first thing he says is it's 15,000 words. And I'm like, oh, that's 14,000 more wait, than I'm wait, willing wait. to read. <laughs> you think that more words is better? <laughs> I don't, I don't know if it's just that he's really, because I, I believe he's a, a mathematician, but he is really into just telling you how many words is in a piece. And I'm just like, something about that just makes me that much less likely to want to read yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've read a few math papers and my general impression is that there's no English in them at all. So how you count words, I don't know. And I, I teach science writing to students. And one of the things I keep hammering them on is brevity. You know, mm. cut out all the extraneous stuff, no superfluous adjectives, nothing. Just get it down to the bare minimum. And, you know, if you, if you look at any scientific paper in the literature, you'll see that that's, they're, they're not great classic literature. They're kind of boring and technical and descriptive. So he's got everything upside down and backwards. Yeah. Um. But uh, I don't know if anybody's uh, heard of Lindsayan hermeneutics. Uh, so that is, um, he has a thing where he uh, will not read, say, a book by a feminist, but just say that he can tell that it's bad. Um, and so I think that fair enough. I'm, I'm going to just tell you all his stuff is crap. I, I don't need yeah. to read it. All 15,000. I'm just practicing <laughs> His methodology, <laughs> good it's, enough. <laughs> it's funny, it reminds me of another anecdote about Pete, actually, because he will, um, in lecture, and it doesn't matter if it's business ethics or critical thinking, what the class is supposed to be about, he will regularly bring up a straw man of feminism. Now, uh, now he has said in classes before that the further uh, from your bailiwick you get, the less uh, authoritative your words are, and yet he will stand up there and just paint with a huge broad brush about what feminism feminism is and isn't and what feminists are and aren't doing and yet there's no evidence that he's researched feminism or written any papers no. in feminism i've been in his office a hundred times there are no feminist authors on on his bookshelf as far as i know the only person who even calls themselves a feminist that he interfaces with is christina hoff summers and that is a conversation for another time oh, oh, but yeah. And yet he he will then write off all of feminism with this authoritative tone because it's missing the point. He actually does this in a lesser degree with the left. He'll he'll he obviously is atheist and uh, vocal about it, and so he will go off about uh, the faithful or the religious, but never the right, never the right wing. However, he will he will swipe the entirety of the left for 15, 20 minutes about this and that as one big category. And yet there's, there's there's no indication that he has any background in uh, political philosophy yeah. or political science or uh, any of that sort of thing. And wait, wait, why is he talking about this stuff in his classes? I mean, because his lectures only exist to let him pontificate on whatever's on his mind from one semester to the next. Yeah, because I, you know, I'm I'm teaching biology, yet I am, you know, pro feminism and atheism and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It just never comes up in my classes. <laughs> I cannot imagine. Here I am talking about cellular metabolism, for instance, and just deciding, oh, well, I got a rant about the metabolism of feminists. <laughs> it's inferior. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Maybe that's why he was happy to get a position in a philosophy department, because then there's more wiggle room for what you can, you know, right. tangent on. I'm speculating. Yeah, well, th that's unfair, though. I mean... Because I've I've taken philosophy courses, I've read philosophy books, and there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Oh well, certainly, but there's also yeah. there's going to be more wiggle room in in if you design a philosophy of education class, then you can bring your friend Robert Kramer, who's a, a conservative radio guy here in Portland who owns charter schools, to come into your class and give an hour and a half lecture about the value of charter schools. You can get away with that kind of wiggle room. But if you're doing a if you're doing a 400 level class on uh, you know on Kierkegaard, you kind of got to stick to Kierkegaard. Now you can get yeah. off on Christianity or, or whatever, but you can't you can't suddenly get into why vegans are wrong, you know? Mm. 
Uh -huh. But a lot of the courses that he covers, there's enough there's enough mm -hmm. bandwidth that he can kind of bring into it whatever he wants to and justify it as being relevant to his overall aims for the course. I mean, in uh, my experience, I guess biology doesn't have the wiggle room. Yeah, and I and I can you know if if I started going off tangent on anything, uh, students do mention this you know in their in their reviews and so forth, and my colleagues and my. You know, my administrators would see this stuff and they would come back to me and I would hear all about it. So it just it just surprises me that anyone can get away with that. We have a job to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I feel like he's got a, I don't know. The, I don't remember the name of the head of the philosophy department, but I feel like there's a real kinship there that they have a lot of things in common. And oh. so a, a bit of his leeway comes from that, um, including his proclivity toward female students I feel like there's a uh... oh yeah he sleeps with students the, I met, not, not Bogosian you're talking no, about Bogosian does yeah oh yeah what oh yeah it's and and TAs too yeah he regularly sleeps with members of the student body yeah it's the worst kept secret in the philosophy department there was an investigation about it last year and it never went anywhere but yeah he normally at least has the uh, has the self-control to wait until the 10 week course is over and then we'll sleep with them, but not always. I, I know for a fact he's slept with students currently in his class without question. Wow, okay, oh, wow. Yeah. So speaking of you know situational ethics, like he, he and his wife have an understanding. Yeah. It's pretty well known, so. I mean, this okay. isn't anything I haven't talked about before. I'm not trying to you know throw Molotov cocktails or anything, but. No, 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 but. Somebody ought to get BuzzFeed to work on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um. So it, that's it, this. These are the kinds of things I'm I'm thinking of when I say he's never really taken his responsibilities seriously. He's never really taken um, being an academic seriously. Uh, his position at Portland State works for him, but it, he's not terribly committed to it in any way that I can see. I don't know that he's even done much publishing. He doesn't do any sort of research or anything. He teaches more or less the same classes over and over. Um, and and meanwhile, he works on he works on bringing uh, high profile, controversial speakers to campus, not to lecture, but to have fireside chats. I don't even know what he and Carl Benjamin had a fireside chat about. But this is more what he's doing with his time than worrying about actually conveying what critical thinking is supposed to be or actually conveying what business ethics you should carry with you as you go to business school or these sorts of things he's ostensibly supposed to be instructing on yeah i i have to ask a slightly tangential but related question about psu and the philosophy department what's the gender breakdown do you have a do you have a majority of men taking the classes um, and uh it's it skews uh not not extremely male. There are okay. a lot. There are a lot of female students in the department and uh, uh, actually in the faculty. Um, okay. My my favorite uh, professor at the entirety of the school is uh, teaches in the philosophy department. There, Dr. Coventry. She's world class. A world class Hume scholar. She's she's very very difficult and very very good. Um, uh -huh. So it's a it's not a hostile department to women yeah. necessarily. Um, and I also, uh, several of the TAs that I conferred with uh, were women also, and they were to varying degrees on the receiving end of uh, Pete's advances, but at no time did they ever give me the impression that the department as a whole was a place they did not feel comfortable or felt, okay. uh, you know, targeted or whatever. It's, it's just a little bit odd, because I mean, I'm, uh, you know, here in, in biology, we're majority of women students and the faculty is evenly split between men and women. And if this kind of stuff started going down, there would be hell to pay. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say the majority would speak up against it, but there'd always be somebody who would be in there. And we actually did have a professor several years ago who, who was canoodling with the students. And it was, it raised a big stink that with everyone tried, you know, everyone in the administration tried to keep as quiet as possible. Um, and at least what happened is they ended up telling this this professor, nope, sorry, you are cut off from all future promotion. He wasn't fired or anything, but he was tenured. But they told him, nope, sorry, you're never, ever, ever going to be full professor. Mm. And we're going to be monitoring your behavior closely and sort of things like that. 
so you know it's just surprising that somebody could sleep around and not raise any attention well i know that some schools have rules and some do not um is there like a rule at portland state I'm I'm not sure. That's not clear to me. But I I mean I do I do know from another TA that they were contacted about an investigation looking into whether or not he was uh, he was being discriminatory against female students generally. That included sexual conduct, but I don't know to what degree. And I never heard anything else about it, so I have to think nothing came of it. But the idea that that Portland State maybe has been looking for a reason to get to not renew this guy's contract for a while is not the craziest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. You know, and that this might have been the option for them to have a legit way to do it. But um, also, I, I don't think he's terribly important in the department, really. Like, I don't, I, most of the other um, professors that I spent time with didn't have any regard for him in any way. Like, they knew who he was, and that was about all they had to say about it. So, you know. Uh -huh. If the if the uh, department chair liked him and nobody else really cared that much, I don't know. Yeah, he's he's doing credit hours. That's what they care about. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm just very taken aback by this. I didn't yeah. expect that. Um, yeah. Um. Well, I I just hope that everybody is uh, okay. So. It sounds like I guess that they are. It didn't um, seem as if he was coercive or anything. I mean, there's obviously the moral argument that if you're in a position of authority, etc., mm -hmm. like why we have guidelines against this sort of thing. But I never got the impression um, that he really. I mean, he's a charming guy. Uh, apparently, he's attractive. Uh, he didn't have trouble in this regard. Apparently, I don't. I never got the impression that he was coercive sexually. Mm -hmm. Just that he was, uh, you know, willing. So. <laughs> I mean, he keeps a bedroll in his office next to his desk, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, I mean. Oh, good. Can, Sorry, can get, <laughs> Sorry can it's only for him. Keep coming back to me. <laughs> yeah, he's he's headed towards a landmine. I mean, uh, all yeah. it's going to take is one student, and boom, he is in big trouble. Well, um, um, yeah, I don't know. So that well, that's crazy. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, um, get ready, Brian. Buzzfeed will be contacting you. <laughs> 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 All right. So I, I'm worried, like that now that. Um, uh, anyway, this was news to me, but here we are, and uh, let's. Uh, I think that um, we should probably move on <laughs> because I, I honestly have no idea uh, yeah. about any of this stuff and I, I don't yeah. know. Um, well, let me, I, let me, let, let me cleanse our palate with more uh, uh, reminiscences of uh, working for Dr. Bogosian. How's that? Yes, please. Um, from the very <laughs> beginning, he was, he was somewhat paranoid about quote enemies. Mm -hmm. Not just in the in the school, like at the at the university, but more generally, the first uh, year I started working for him, he actually tasked me to uh, keep an eye on his online presence and see if people were conspiring against him. Um, he would regularly, when uh, a class would fill up on the first day, he'd say he'd make a big show of, "Oh, make sure you're not sitting in the aisles." You know, the fire marshal could shut us down, and my enemies would just love that. This <laughs> kind of stuff came up pretty regularly. You know, like he was. He was doing the good fight, but boy, he was getting some people really angry at him. And this was shortly, this was even before his book came out. So, you know, he hadn't really kicked up much controversy yet. So it kind of spoke to me as far as how he saw himself, you know? Mm. And uh, I have never had another university professor talk about their enemies ever. So yeah. I, I had a personal, a very brief personal interaction with him. Um, and the thing that came across to me was that he was paranoid. Like he's, um, so you may or may not remember <clears throat> MythCon. Originally I was supposed to debate Peter Bogosian mm -hmm. and James Lindsay. It's still not clear to me why they pulled out. I was interested in that because I've, sadly I've, I've been on this roller coaster as a Richard Carrier fan. I actually got to meet him at PSU and now I 
don't even want his books on my shelf anymore for obvious <laughs> reasons. But so I, I was very interested as to why they just pulled out together with no explanation. But um, yeah, your guess is as good <laughs> as mine. Yeah. But prior to that, um, we had like a couple of conference calls with the the MythCon people just. Or, or it was just one with just me and him and the MythCon people just to sort of set up some of the logistics about the debate. And that was like literally it. It wasn't anything that we were getting too deeply into. But before we could talk, he was very insistent that we all um, promise not to be recording the conversation. And I just found that very odd. Like, mm. Why would I? Re why would anybody record this conversation? And <laughs> what? What is it that you're planning to say? Like, uh, this is just <laughs> like, you know, going over things. Like, the moderator is gonna do X, Y, Z, and then this person goes for this person. Like that. It, it, there was nothing going on that was going to be. Um concerning in that way and it was just like i remember saying you know sort of going back and, and chatting um with some people after and saying god he is weird <laughs> this guy is so paranoid yeah. like he really yeah. did act like uh, the way that he came across it it was as if he was really believed that i was going to do something nefarious somehow <laughs> like i don't even know what <laughs> like you're gonna find a way to weaponize what side of the stage he's sitting on yeah, yeah. he'll sit on the left side he said he was gonna be on the left side uh -huh. we got him now <laughs> like <laughs> and i can yeah. prove it it's, it's this is this is very peculiar because i i mean i do have enemies and my my administrators can tell you that because they get the email Mm. demanding that I be fired and so forth. But my approach has always been, yeah, you want to record me? Go ahead. I'm I'm not going to say anything that could get me in trouble. You know, I'm not, and not because I'm being secretive or paranoid, it's just because I I have I have opinions, but my opinions I think I can justify. And uh so it's weird to hear that somebody who's so outspoken about atheism and all this stuff is deep in his heart terrified that some some of it will get out it's just weird mm. yeah i i don't know it it just it did strike me as weird like i and i haven't really told that story um uh, much yeah. outside of sort of private things it just you when you mentioned that that's what it occurred to me like yeah he was very that was exactly my impression was that he was a, a very paranoid fella, you know, and it must, that must hey, be hard. Wait a minute. I just realized you have lured me into this chat to get me to reveal <laughs> something that you can use to get me. All right. Didn't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <Darn. Now> <laughs> I'm just not paranoid enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, if people try hard enough, I'm sure that they can find a hundred things to like uh, to throw to throw out and say, "Oh, I he she said this, she did that." Oh yeah, I'm absolutely hundred percent sure. And then I'm either I'm just going to tell the truth, and people are either going to believe it or they're not. You know, yeah. like uh, that's if you're going to be a public person, I think that you have to sort of deal with and contextualize um that concern because yeah i mean i suppose it is a concern but wh what are you going to do like sit around and worry about it constantly yeah, like, or, yeah or or just reduce your opinions to nothing controversial at all and just recite problem at the audience that's not interesting either mm. somebody so. hello is, you're no? throbbing am i uh oh, Brian, am I there? Hello, testing. Uh, you're here oh. now. Oh, okay, okay. Weird. Uh, somebody like Pete, who has gone out of their way to court controversy, and yet on the other side of the coin to be worried about certain things being used against him. Like it's, I don't, I don't know if he just maybe thinks he's more famous than he is, or 
you know, because he's he's always trying to jump on uh, uh, coattails of people. Like he made a big thing when his good friend Michael Shermer came to town, or his good friend Lawrence Krauss came to town, you know, to try and uh, drum up interest in the department and his classes and stuff. And yet, I don't know. I mean, PC, you're you're more of a well known figure, but you you don't try to be controversial. You just you just have a knack. It's right? yes, it's just a natural talent I have. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and but you know also you know I. I knew Michael Shermer. I knew Lawrence Krauss. There was a time when we were buddies, and I never ever considered that this was grounds for increasing my prestige. And you know, nowadays I'm just trying mm -hmm. to make people forget that I was ever friends with him. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I it does seem like. Well, I mean, there's a lot of money in. Mm. Um, this particular grift if you could get right on it like i just don't know if uh i i think they're getting on it pretty good right now like it, it seems like they're getting traction now because these ironically these people love a good victim narrative um and they're being provided one so it makes uh, their grievances credible so of course they like that good victim narrative <laughs> Yeah, uh, but yeah, of course, all they could ever come up with is consequences. Somebody faced consequences of their actions. Therefore, how dare they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I can't imagine. Um, yeah, but I mean, imagine bringing uh, Carl Benjamin to a philosophy class. God. <laughs> <laughs> I want my money back. <laughs> yeah, I've tried listening to a few of that guy's videos, and he's 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 a nothing burger. He's got no, he's got no talents. He just talks nonstop. Well, I suspect now, uh, knowing Pete as I do, even though we don't really know each other anymore, he he went from really. For lack of a better term, worshiping at the altar of the four horsemen, like he has, he has used their books in courses. He has a picture of Hitch up on his office wall, and at some point, the just being the the fire brand bomb thrower in that regard kind of started to peter out. And I think he's consciously moving to the market of the the um, the Rubens and the Petersons, and and trying to go that way of oh you know postmodernism is the problem not just not just the the virus of religion you know mm -hmm. I, I think it's a conscious move on his point that like well that's you know kind of like we've seen Louis C.K. doing I think is like well okay yeah. if if only the crazy right are the only people that aren't pissed at me then I'm gonna go for their dollars I mean mm -hmm. I, I it sounds cynical but I just all evidence suggests that, that it's at least plausible that that, that he's consciously doing that. Yeah, well, it's it's his fallback for when he gets fired from PSU, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> and every couple of months, somebody will ask him a hard question. He's since blocked me on Twitter because I'll ask him questions he doesn't like. But more often than not, he'll answer with, "Oh, I'll I'll be addressing that in my next book." So hey, maybe he's maybe oh. he's going to be a an author that also happens to have a doctorate. Uh huh. Yeah. Nice work if you can get it. Yeah, <laughs> I guess <laughs> I wouldn't know. Well, and it probably <laughs> made his day to get a letter from uh, Jordan Peterson himself. I mean, probably made his day. I can only imagine. And that letter was so terrible. It was so <laughs> bad. I was like, oh my god, please never ever defend me <laughs> from an ethics file. <laughs> it reinforces so many things that this tempest in a teacup is not about. It, right. It's just it's so about that other side of the narrative that they're trying to spin. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. It, it, he barely touched on things like ethics or Peter. It was all like postmodernist, neo yeah, Marxist, blah 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 blah. Yeah. You know, I'm just gonna get out my tinfoil hat. I'll put mm -hmm. it on and I'll start typing away. You know? Well, I have to say it's the most cogent thing of his I've read in a long time that I could actually follow it all the way through. So at least he had that going for him. <laughs> yeah, there was no like tangents about lobsters. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> See, what happened is there were these lobsters. <laughs> did they have an IRB panel? No, they did not. <laughs> and everything worked out great for them. The all end. Right. They all yeah. just happily peed in each other's faces. <laughs> yeah. 
and he's got Steve Pinker and Richard Dawkins all backing him. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's a that is a tribal thing, right? That's tribalism. Yeah, yeah. But and I, I get it. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that I've never been more likely to um, look fondly upon people that were allies with me or that I knew personally or, mm -hmm. you know, like, I'm sure that that is completely normal. I, I just wish they were more conscious of it. That's all. Mm -hmm. And not suggesting that they are somehow above these mortal biases that the rest of us all have to deal with not not them they're just like and and i believe steven pinker even said something like um that he would have gotten irb approval but he oh. you know but peter bogosian of course wouldn't know he's just philo philosophy so they should just yeah. let him know but ignorance does not excuse you yeah <laughs> that's the thing well, and Pete's, uh, Pete's doctorate was dealing with uh, uh, Socratic methodology with uh, prison populations. So you can't tell me he didn't go through a review board for that. Right. You know? So, yeah. But it makes I, sense that the, the people in his tribe are going to defend him, that defensiveness, back when I first started knowing Pete. And he was saying stupid shit on Twitter like, oh, if being homosexual is an innate characteristic, what is there to be prideful of? And mm. people took that as just being homophobic and ignorant. And and I tried to defend him that, well, no, he's he's trying to make a point here. And I uh -huh. wish I hadn't have bothered, but you know, because we were on the same side against the, the crazy religionists, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah. how far from the pack I've strayed, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, you SJW. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually sitting here in a feminist frequency t shirt, in fact, on purpose. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna take we're all gonna become Marxists and take it all down. Smash yeah. the patriarchy. What t shirt am I wearing? I don't think I'm wearing a good t shirt. No, mine's just got a big octopus on it. Sorry. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I like it. And uh I'm wearing a heart shirt. See? Very okay. Good. So uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, I just, I've <laughs> I just never been on a, a live stream before, and I may never be on another one. So I wanted to take the opportunity to promote a brand I really like, you know? All right. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, great. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's for, is we're all, we're all promoting soft, squishy things. <laughs> don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, and comment. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess... Um, I guess we're at a, um, are there any questions from the chat before we get going? Um, so, and uh, I'll just, it takes a couple minutes for the chat to yeah. talk, um, to tell me about it. But then after that, I think we can probably wrap up. Okay. Um, yeah. Unless. I'm watching. Is there any, uh, did anybody have any final thoughts that they wanted to discuss? Any more dirt on Peter? I think we've had enough. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some random geek. <laughs> yeah. Brian just stole the entire show. It's just, yeah. God, I should just go home and cry. No, I am home. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, we can all what? cry later. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's worth maybe touching on that this isn't a watershed moment like many of the um, uh, defenders of the three are trying to make it seem like, oh, this this is an important moment in academic history. Like, whether or not anything comes from this at Portland State, I don't think it's necessarily relevant because they could have chosen to not renew Dr. Bogosian's contract after two years were up for, for no reason at all. It's an at-will state. I don't think that changes at the academic level, you know, whether or not you can just let somebody go or not rehire them willy-nilly. So I, it's not clear to me what this will do with the, the uh, until now, <laughs> relatively benign issue of uh, IRBs. Mm. Does anybody else have any opinion on that? Oh, there's, there are, uh, there's always been people who are screaming about just getting rid of IRBs out altogether, but I, that won't happen, especially not with this study. This is, this is a terrible piece of work. 
-hmm. it's not going to justify you know throwing out any old protocols or anything um and actually you know when you get right down to it this little episode is going to do pretty much nothing you know everyone is saying no he's not going to get fired for this you know the only person saying he might be is peter bogosian uh it's it's a uh, it's an annoying thing. It's a it's a black mark on his record. You know, there there might be a, you know somebody might wag a finger at him in the administration, but he's not going to lose his job over this. However, what is next at his next next contract review? People are going to look at this, and it may be a factor. It may sway a few faculty to say, "No, we shouldn't renew this guy. We can get somebody better." Hmm. So, um, yeah, I guess that there was a question that what would be a reasonable penalty for this level of IRB violation? Uh, there, there have been there have been cases like this before, and you know, with even more extreme falsification of data, where the penalty has been no, we're not going to support your research anymore. You are prohibited from doing any kind of you know publishable research for the next two years or five years or forever. Uh, so, you know, I kind of think that would happen. That then he's not he's not even trying, so it's, that's not going to be a big deal. Uh, it would also mean things like, well, you're not going to get any of our in-house grants, but do you need money to do philosophy? I don't know. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so you know there'll be there'll be little things like that that will make it more difficult for him to do credible research and dig himself out of the hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I just think well, whatever would be um, normal or or standard, and I'm sure that there are standard things. Um, uh, I think that it's one thing that we should talk about is that Peter has made people doing an important and no doubt thankless job. He's just made their job so much harder. Yeah. And made you them know? look like jerks. And, yeah. And um, he's accused them without any evidence of all kinds of things, you know, um, or uh, the idea that this is a, that these aren't people who are doing what they are trained to do, what their job is to do. Um, probably what they, even if they didn't want to do it, what they have to do, because I, I doubt that these are regulations you can just like, oh, fuck it, just, yeah, it's yeah. Pete, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's not how these things work. I mean, that, um, working in the kind of fields I did, where it came to regulations and ethics and things none of those things were ever voluntary like, <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> like a judgment right. thing that you got to decide if you wanted to do this or not these are you know uh, uh, things that are um they're laid out exactly how this works and you got to do it and that's just the end of that so right. um his going after them and talking about how um this is like them bowing down before social justice or the great power of the gender studies oligarchy i don't know it, which is crazy just madness because that's just not how anything works <laughs> like i promise you that they're the, the gender studies people are not ruling the universities. <laughs> right. Right. Like find their office. Yeah. <laughs> Where even are they? You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, can they get in to talk to the president of the university? Can they get, you know, the kind of uh money and funding that they want? No. <laughs> like <laughs> that would be what they would probably try to they don't want to fire Peter Bogosian. Like they want to actually get funding. And that's not happening either. So it's it's just this in in trying to send up uh, to make this into a Promethean battle that it isn't. 
you know, uh, he's just pissing all over that these these professional people doing an important job, um, one that needs to be done, one that needs to be done well, um, and doesn't need nine, th you know, doesn't need like Jordan Peterson accusing them of malevolence and Marxism, <laughs> you know. Uh, or all these people just like, yeah, get him, get him, Peter, fight the good fight. Like, it's just, these are just people saying, look, you didn't follow the rules, man. Yeah. Well, and, and more than that, too, it's, you know, this whole anti postmodernism shtick. You know, postmodernism is actually a skeptical look at dogma, it's, it's a way to deconstruct the information that's been passed down and that everyone takes for granted. And, and in that sense, it's something skeptics ought to approve of. But the thing is, these people don't understand what postmodern postmodernism is. They think it's just, oh, right. you can just write any old gobbledygook you want and get published. That's not right. what it is at all. And so they're discrediting, you know, a, a legitimate, you know, a legitimate protocol for understanding and that's again anti knowledge, anti science, and so that's that's a disgraceful thing too. I I really wish that instead of making up these stories as Peterson and Bogosian do about what postmodernism is, they actually looked at the stuff. Right. Yeah, it's and you know five years before it was postmodernism. In my experience, it was it was cultural relativism. And I've taken a little uh, anthropology. I value where cultural relativism actually came from, why it was a useful scientific methodology, but also that it had some limitations. It wasn't absolute relativism of everything, but for people that misunderstood it, it was a it was a boogeyman in the exact mm -hmm. same way that now postmodernism has become the ur boogeyman in that regard. And it's yeah, just I, I think it was because no people, a lot of people don't get what postmodernism is, but. I don't think it ever made any sense because I remember when I was, you know, having cultural relativism levied at me all the time in the same breath as somebody talking about how I was virtue signaling and, you know, <laughs> being moralistic towards them. Like, I don't think you get how these things. <laughs> right. Like, it just doesn't work. <laughs> And yes, um, you can find people who carry it to an extreme and make it ridiculous. And that's yeah. that's always the case. And I would say, you know, it's the same thing in every discipline. Like right now, what I see is an awful lot of people jumping on the genetic determinism bandwagon and treating yeah. this as an absolute truth. Right. And geneticists will all tell you, you know, this this is this is something that's becoming more and more significant in literature is people coming out and saying, no, that's not how genetics works. It's far more complicated than you think that, um, you know, you know, you read, it's, it's even getting into the po popular literature. If you read Carl Zimmer's book, you know, about uh, genetics, what was it? She has her mother's laugh. One of the things it's doing is saying that genetics is a heck of a lot more complicated than you think. Mm -hmm. And you can't reduce it to, you know, just, Oh, you inherited this allele, and that makes you that way. And it's, and intelligence is inherited in this simple way. No, nope, doesn't work. And you know, you could go after genetics and molecular biology in the same way by caricaturing the extremes and making it look like geneticists are a bunch of idiots. And that's that's exactly the tactic that Peterson and Bogosian and all those people are taking to postmodernism and gender studies and feminism they, mm -hmm. they misrepresent those fields so grossly it's it's embarrassing to see mm -hmm. uh elizabeth godin asks pz myers could you imagine bogosian soliciting public sympathy being itself considered grounds for discipline oh that's an interesting question, but no, I can't. I can't quite imagine that. That uh, you know that that we sort of wall off these aspects of our career, and so yeah. being a popular or unpopular person in the general public, you know, for example, with with my with my promotion materials and all that stuff, the stuff I do on the blog got one line 
in a gigantic collection of papers. So that would be what would go on here is, oh, people don't like Peter Bogosian, so what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The largest fallout I, I predict coming from this is kind of, I keep in mind that nobody really gave a shit about Dave Rubin until he wasn't with the Young Turks anymore. And then just the fact that like, oh, this firebrand is streaking out of his own. I could see Pete totally going like in that route of like controversial PSU philosopher now out on his own and here's his Patreon, you know? And but, then he can also he can also bank on being an anti academic after that. Going after sure. universities. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe he can get a gig at Prager U. Yeah. Spend right. all his time hanging out with the Weinsteins. <laughs> That's punishment enough for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost cruel. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. But I, I guess I think that we've, um, I think we have talked uh, this through as much as we can. It's getting, we've been here, what, an hour and a half, I think. So. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and bow out first. Um, All right. uh, turn the camera back on so I can say hi. Bye, everybody. Yeah, um, it was good, good to hear from you. Yeah, good to meet you, PZ. Thank yeah. you. Good to finally talk with you, Chrissy. Oh, um, absolutely. And if the handful of people are interested that are following, you can follow my Twitter at R1Z4T. That's Rizat. Um, I don't know why you'd want to. I just complain about stuff, but uh, there it is. There's. Hey, that's there. what I do. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a growth industry. So, uh, but thanks for having me on, and uh, y'all have a good night. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Bye, everybody. You know I love you. <laughs> it's been fun. Talk to you later. <laughs>